three or four of those. The first one uh, I want to talk about automatic fingerprint identification systems. Uh, that system is going to be upgraded fairly soon. Uh, will be uh, and this upgrade is required for security and, and resiliency, but it also is going to expand the the availability of that system, especially mobile APHIS for patrol officers out in the street. Uh, looking forward to that. The identity and access management service uh, has also been upgraded recently for security purposes. That system allows access to our regional uh, programs and uh, is a secure access using your local credentials. The NCR geospatial data exchange is um, just what it sounds like. It's sharing map information. The, uh, the latest upgrade in that system is in the past, it's been very focused on public safety, primarily fire and rescue and sharing uh, real time data on incident and unit location. But this year we leveraged that to build out a layer on food security and food access points in the region. The, the next is the NCR law enforcement license plate reader program. Uh, that program had been hosted by the District of Columbia, specifically Metro PD, and we are transitioning that over in that position will now reside at your COG offices uh, in, after the first of this year. The law enforcement information exchange is a new, um, new, lo or new COG locally funded project. It's been migrated off of the, the, the UASI grant as of this year. The Rail Operations Control Center, a rail fire liaison position that supports um, WMATA and especially on the rail operations, like was mentioned earlier, the incident that occurred, uh, they would be directly involved in that. That is now also being transitioned to contract staff that will be working directly for COG and, and help uh, with the management will be through our fire and rescue chiefs in the region. And a police mutual aid radio system uh, this is what is used when we're requesting emergency support in the police environments. And NCR Automated Property Identification Database, or COG PON, so that's sharing of information on PON data across the region that law enforcement uses to identify stolen property. And the last is our Special Weapons and Tactics Training Fund. Uh, we'll be actually holding a regional training uh, in probably three to four months, we're in the, uh, in the process of getting our contractors put together for that right now. And I know that was quick, so, but I'm going to turn it back over to Chuck. Thank you. A lot of details there. Two ways to follow up on those details. You may contact Scott Boggs at sboggs at mwcog.org or contact your city or county manager as they were briefed out on these things in a bit more detail uh, one week ago. Want to uh, um, highlight now Janelle Partman. Uh, Janelle is often the transmitter of the board packets. Uh, she did the roll call today. So I just want to give her a minute to introduce herself and uh, to share a couple of things that she does here at COG. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate the opportunity to put a face to my name on all the board emails. Um, I'm Janelle Partman, as Chuck said. I work in the Office of Communications as well as the Executive Office alongside Monica. Um, my range of responsibilities includes helping manage COG social media accounts, audio and video production, and developing news content, and a couple other things regarding media relations and those type of things. Um, I've enjoyed working with many of you on COG's various media projects and look forward to continuing this work in upcoming projects, including COG's new podcast, Think Regionally, which is available today. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Janelle. Um, just a little bit more about the podcast that premieres today. Uh, Janelle and her colleagues, Megan uh, Goodman and Steve Kenya, have been working with uh, Robert McCartney to uh, um, issue this first podcast. Uh, it's called Think Regionally, and we encourage everyone to have a listen, um, preferably at 2.01 p.m. today when the meeting is done. If staff could put a link to that podcast, I'd appreciate it. Um, so pleased to have Bob coming right from the Washington Post to be doing this regional work with us. Uh, given today's agenda, it's fitting that our first podcast episode centers on, centers on advancing equity and equity emphasis areas. Glad to have uh, um, speakers on this podcast with Bob, including uh, United Way's Rosie Allen Herring, Dr. Kavita Patel from Mary Center in Prince George's, and Mer Montgomery County Council Member Nancy Navarro. Mr. Chairman, happy to uh, answer questions on these things or other COG matters. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much. Very, very excited about the uh, podcast with Bob McCartney. I think it's such a, a fitting uh, marriage with uh, with Cog and I, our work and an opportunity to amplify the work that we are doing. And uh, Janelle, really good to, uh, to, to see your face. Uh, I don't have any questions. Does anyone have questions for uh, Executive Director Chuck Bean? All right, seeing none, we will move um, to it. Oh. Yeah, can Sorry. you hear me? Yes. Hey, good afternoon to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for acknowledging me, Keith. Hey, uh, a couple of things that I wanted to uh, bring up, and I'm not sure if this is the most appropriate time, but I, uh, I did want to uh, bring up um, an issue regarding the uh, bike pedestrian bridge um around the northwest uh anacostia branch near the uh west highsville uh metro station i know that um i, I was my understanding is that uh there was some damage uh from a recent flood and i was just wondering whether whether it would be appropriate to uh for, for Kong to take a look at uh take a look at that issue and i don't know um try to work towards some resolution of it uh, and again, you know, if there's a better channel by which I could share this, feel free to let me know. But I wanted to bring that up. Thank you, Colin. Um, I didn't hear the name of the bridge that you mentioned. Yeah, it's a bike pedestrian bridge, and it's uh, by the Northwest Anacostia branch. Okay, on the on the DC side. Yes. Okay, if you email me, I'll 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 get the right people connected. Okay, um, and then um, a couple of other things. Um, one, uh, and I don't want to take on this, but is there anything going on um, that you could share about Cox staff's efforts to uh, take a look at the uh, Maglev project? So could we, um, let me, well, let me see if Chuck, um, since we're on the executive director's report, uh, Chuck, do you, do you have thoughts on uh, COG's role, a uh, possible role in the Maglev project? Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, have Mr. Srikant, the deputy executive director of, for Metropolitan Planning, uh, follow up Mr. Bird on uh, both the bike pad bridge as well as the Maglev issue and can bring those thoughts back to the executive committee for further consideration, perhaps at uh, next month's meeting. All right, thank you. And then the last thing, and I don't want to take too much time, but I just want to put it in the queue. If if I could get somebody to shoot me an email as well about um, what the latest is in terms of COG's work around agriculture, um, I, I'd be grateful. I really appreciate it. And thanks again for your time. Yeah, we'll be happy to fo follow up on that. It's uh, related thank to the food security me. item that we have on today's board gender agenda, in fact. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question of the executive director? Yes, please, Ms. Ms. Perry. Uh, we, uh, Mr. Bean, uh, you received a letter over the weekend uh, requesting that you convene uh, a discussion on reciprocity and ticket enforcement as a safety measure. Um, you received that letter and I just have you decided yet how you would address that issue. Thank you. I did receive that letter from deputy mayor uh, Babers and uh, we are reviewing that now. I asked some follow up questions so I could understand the contours of these of that issue and uh, understand what's being asked of talk so that we may uh, assist as best we can. Okay, I, I think just a convener is what's being requested. Okay, thank you. I know that the mayor is aware of it, of this meeting today, and so I may get asked a question. What did you say? How you plan to address that? So, I can tell her that you are reviewing it. Yes, uh, Deputy Mayor and I are in communication as we speak. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? All right, uh, with that, we will move to agenda item five approval of the September 8th, uh, the meetings uh, minutes from our September 8th board meeting. Uh, is there a motion and a second to approve the minutes? I move, Mr. Second. Chairman. All right, we have a motion and a second. Are there any abstentions or nay votes? 
Hearing none, the motion passes. Uh, moving to agenda item six, which is the consent agenda, and you have that in your packet. Um, we have nine resolutions on the consent agenda today, including the nomination of the legislative and nominating committees, two administrative updates, and a number of program contract approvals. Uh, this is on page 15 of your board packet. Is there a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda items? Move so approval moved. of the consent agenda. All right, second. we have a motion and a second. 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 Are there any abstentions or nay votes? Hearing none, the motion passes. Uh, once on the agenda item seven, Climate and Energy Leadership Awards. The uh, COGS Climate and Energy Leadership Awards recognizes organizations in the region that work to advance the regional climate and energy goals established by leaders at COGS while prioritizing historically underserved populations in the planning of their programs. Today, COG will recognize one government organization and one non-government organization for their outstanding efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and advance equity across the region. Uh, so I would like to welcome our Climate, Energy, and Environment Policy Committee Chair, Denny Tavares, who will be joined by COG's Air and Climate Public Advisory Committee Chair, Tara Fairley, to recognize the award recipients. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good, everybody. I hope everybody's having a great day. First, I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, co-presenter today. Again, that was uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Mr. Chair uh, White, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Vice Chair Tara Faley of the Air and Climate and Public Advisory Committee, um, ACPAC's Chair, Vice Chair, and the entire committee put a lot of time into the awards program, including reviewing and judging these applications. Uh, and, and we thank you for those efforts. Uh, before we announce the uh, awardees, I wanna thank the artist who, was um, who has designed and created the awards since the start of the program in 2014. And this is uh, Ms. Janet Wittenberg, uh, is a local artist and that, that creates these beautifully handcrafted pieces of art. And for that, we thank you, uh, Janet. Thank you for being a, a local shining star for us here. Uh, and so now on to the awards. Uh, the program, as mentioned this year, sought to recognize environmental programs that showed outstanding efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promoted equitable community engagement. We are awarding in only two categories, like mentioned this year, one in local juris in a local jurisdiction and one in the non nonprofit sector. Uh, after the awardees are announced, we will show a short video clip featuring these awardees. So with that, let's go on to the presentation. So in the government category, the first awardee is Arlington County's Department of Environmental Services for his uh, Lubber uh, Run Community Center project designed as the county's first net zero energy building, in addition to three net zero energy county public schools and the new community center that was completed in 2020 and is double the size of the previous community center, but is still able to minimize energy use. A battery storage, it has a battery storage system, which will help reduce the building's impact on the grid but also increase resilience by serving as a backup power source for the entire building. And if that, does, I don't know if it sounds sexy to you, but it does to me. With no backup generator, controls were designed so that the community center can operate off the grid during most times of the year. That sounds sexy. We need to be striving for all of that. So with that, let's congratulate our winner. And uh, moving forward now to Ms. Akpak's Vice Chair, Bailey, as she presents the second award. Thank you so much, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks again for the introductions and the warm welcome here on the call today. Um, and again, my name is Tara Bailey, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Air and Climate Public Advisory Committee. Um, and it's really an honor to be invited to, to join you all today and uh, to celebrate our awardees. 
Um, so I'm excited to announce that our second awardee in the non governmental category this year is the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority or WMATA. Um, and we're recognizing them for their ambitious energy solution platform improvement project. This is a multi year rehabilitation project aiming to make outdoor stations safer and more accessible for Metro customers. Um, while they've had a number of capital improvement projects underway. WMATA aimed to reduce their energy use during construction at shutdown stations by rethinking how electricity was distributed. Uh, and previously, generators had been required to supply electricity to the stations, but they were very unreliable and prone to spills. So this innovative, innovative solution sought to solve these problems through a new temporary distribution panel that takes advantage of existing electricity sources. Uh, the approach reduces energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions and also increases reliability and efficiency for critical electric systems. In the end, um, this solution ultimately cut the use of generators throughout the platform improvement project by a stunning 90%. Uh, so we're really excited to honor their work and their achievements with this award here today. So thanks so much. And let's give them a round of applause as well. <laughs> Is there going to be a video, Chuck? Okay. Thank you to the Council of Governments for this recognition and for all your work that you do to advance the reach of sustainability goals. Here at Metro, we know that public transit plays a key role in tackling climate change. More trips on Metro Rail and Metro Bus means less carbon dioxide in the region and cleaner air in our communities. I am particularly proud of the winning team for their innovative approach to include sustainable practices as part of the Metro's capital program. With, it, with their help, the Platform Improvement Project team has cut the use of gas-powered generators by more than 90%. Not only has this reduced emissions and noise pollution, but has saved the region $5 million in this summer alone. I encourage you to do your part and to take Metro. Hi, I'm Christian Dorsey, a member of the Arlington County Board. And on behalf of my elected official colleagues, our county staff and our county community, I'd like to thank you for this award. We are humbled and honored to receive it in recognition of our commitment to uh, remediating climate change and promoting energy sustainability. I'm standing in front of one of our community investments which exemplify Arlington's commitment. A building that was recently constructed with sustainable materials and that will serve this community for generations due to its high levels of energy efficiency and thoughtful planning. And as we think about being a part of a region that values climate action and climate justice, we are again humbled to be the recipients of this honor. We're always cognizant that the world that we leave for our future generations of children is really up to us. And we're so thrilled to be recognized for taking the necessary actions now. Thank you all. Yeah, another round of applause for, for the recipients and a great video as well. Want to move to uh, agenda item eight, establishing a regional food security work program and committee. Uh, here we will continue our conversation from last month on establishing the food and agriculture regional member or farm policy committee and approving a regional fund to support this work program. Uh, we should all be familiar with this uh, resolution to be considered, but I do want to turn it over to Executive Director Bean to give us a brief overview and update on the FY22 work program funding. Chuck? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As background, we have commonly experienced a pandemic-induced recession, and as we've done that, the incidence of food security has come into clearer focus, as have the importance of federally supported and state or locally delivered programs like 
SNAP or school breakfasts and lunches. Um, as a region, we needed to pivot quickly to provide meals to those who uh, did not have them. And these are among the issues that I would envision this work will help us address. You all will recall at the, board, at the retreat, the board dialogue with the Food, Secu food Security Committee co-chairs, uh, Mary Che, and we're joined today by Craig Rice and John Staley. Um, you were briefed about the proposed work program, and there was evidence a strong interest in making the Farm Committee permanent. Per the board discussion in September, and in deference to member jurisdictions concerns regarding the timing of the mid-budget mid-year budget funding request, COG is no longer requesting funds for this work in FY 20, 2022. The proposal before the board today is two actions. One, approve the establishment of the Farm Policy Committee. Uh, part of the work will be to convene stakeholders to build partnerships related to food security and food access needs across the region. Working together to advocate for greater federal support for food security programs advancing data gathering, analysis, and regional messaging to improve food security, and working with food producers, farmers, and others to address supply, access, equity, and resilience. The second is uh, approval for the establishment of a farm regional fund beginning in FY23 to support the proposed work program. This has been modified per a suggestion the last board meeting to mirror the per capita formulas of other regional funds with a recommendation from the Budget and Finance Committee of a floor of 2,500 for the smallest jurisdictions and a cap of 35,000 for the largest. This also reflects the contributions that have made in this work in the past year. So this is summarized in a memo on pages 39 to 40 of the board packet and the recommended resolution is on page 41. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pleased to answer any questions and joined by Mr. Uh, Rice and Mr. Saley uh, about this proposal about, or about Resolution 35. Uh, thank you, Chuck. I know we discussed this a bit uh, last month, but if there are additional questions, uh, please let us know. Okay, uh, hearing none, um, we want to, uh, to move uh, to a vote. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Yeah. Second. This is to approve uh, resolution R35 2021. Uh, I'd be happy to second. move approval pending growth. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Are there any abstentions or nay votes? All right. Hearing none, the motion passes. And uh, we'll move to agenda item nine the FY 2023 member dues recommendation. Uh, for this item, I invite Executive Director Bean back, along with COG Chief Finance Officer Julie Musog, to brief us on the proposal for the FY23 member dues and regional fees. Uh, after this, uh, the board will be asked to vote to adopt Resolution R45-2021, authorizing the proposal. Uh, so let me turn it over to Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to highlight some of the details of the FY 23 dues analysis presented to the budget and finance committee. I will begin then I'll turn it over to our CFO for additional details and then turn it to Cox secretary treasurer Lusk for the budget and finance committee's recommendation to the board. As background, the budget and finance finance committee consists of the executive committee. The COG corporate officers, the chair of TPB and the chair of MWAC. materials for this item are on page 43 of the board packet. And we will walk through an, an abbreviated version of the slide deck that's found on pages 44 to 66 of the packet. As a reminder about timing, the board sets the dues in the fall for the fiscal year starting next July 1 in order for the member juris jurisdictions to be able to incorporate these assumptions as they formulate their own budgets in the spring. The full COG budget will be considered by the board in late spring for the FY23 fiscal year. Next slide, please. From a programmatic perspective, we are guided by the region forward vision, even as this is being iterated and evolving to incorporate new aspirations and planning planning frameworks like the high capacity transit station areas and equity emphasis areas being considered in item 10 today. 
And while our core disciplinary competencies are in transportation, environment, public safety, and community planning, we are making deliberate strides toward, our, toward a holistic and multidisciplinary approach, what staff are terming a unified planning framework. Next slide, please. While we seek to add our highest value to regional collaboration and collective action, such as Visualize 2045, the Regional Climate and Energy Action Plan, Regional Housing Targets, Regional Mutual Aid Agreements, we concurrently seek to add value to each jurisdiction through technical assistance, sharing of best practices, peer learning, and coordination among the region's chief health officers, fire chiefs, planning directors, and a few dozen other technical committees. Next slide. And we have internal goals to generate quantifiable value to every member juris jurisdiction such that they save twice as much through COG as they expend in member dues. Originally, this focused on collective buying power or cooperative purchasing of commodities, but we have been introducing new opportunities to save money on such items as public safety radios for firefighters and other first responders. And now we're procuring specialized services such as consultants on climate and energy action plans that several jurisdictions are now using. In addition to savings via collective procurement, we are also return value through our growing number of grants programs, including transportation land use connections, enhanced mobility grants. This year valued at $6 million as per consent agenda item D today. And the addition of today's housing affordability planning grants, which is in item 11. I'd like to turn it now to our CFO for more of the specifics of today's recommendation. Julie. Thank you, Chuck. Can we go to the next slide? As you can see, member dues represent about 10% of COG's overall revenue. Um, we use these member dues in four different ways, um, the largest of which 36% goes towards leveraging federally sourced funds. For every dollar in member dues, we leverage $8.31 in federal funding. The majority of this is th uh, for transportation planning and Homeland Security fund utilization. The second largest use of member dues at 31% is to leverage additional resources. This includes programs supported by regional funds. About $1.5 million of member dues leverages an additional 7.1 million from various funding sources. The next use um, is primary program support. Approximately 16% of member dues provide 97% of the funding for critically important programs for health, housing, and equity work that has no other source of funding. This would include convening the regional health directors, support for regional economic development, housing, homelessness count report, and the regional incident command system. The Final way that we use member dues is um, for additional member services, benefits, outreach, and forums. Um, this would include the cooperative purchasing program and leadership training, such as the Institute for Regional Excellence. Next slide. The proposed structure is to um, increase the rate from the FY22 rate of 20, uh, 77 cents to 79 cents. We are also proposing to move the cap from 6% to 7% meaning the rate of increase for any member jurisdiction can be no larger than 7%. And FY21 and FY20, this cap was at 6%. Um, there had been a plan to move this incrementally up, but last year we froze it in place. Um, also last year we did, if you'll recall, a um, member dues rate decrease of about a half a penny, which means that over the two year period, we've had a one and a half cent increase in the member dues rate averaging about three quarters of a penny per year. Next slide. This result is um, an additional $220,000 in revenue in member due revenue. Um, these member dues are required um, for matches in federal programs as well as uh, general cost increases that we're seeing in program needs. Um, this overall percentage increase then is 4.72% from FY22 to FY23. Next slide. Next slide. The regional water and environmental funds follow the same rate increase as the member dues at 4.72%. More details about the programs that they support can be found in the board package is on pages 56 through 58. As a reminder, two thirds of the regional water fund is paid by water and sewer utilities. Next slide. Next slide. 
The Regional Public Safety Fund also follows the same uh, member dues increase rate as the um, and includes and this fund includes support for ongoing mutual aid updates with federal partners, including the National Capitol Police, National Security Council, and the police chiefs. Future leadership training, and it also supports, um, as referenced in the beginning of the meeting, the nine public safety programs that are used day to day by your public safety officials. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> this slide um, details out the total revenue um, for the regional food, agriculture, and regional um, member farm fund. This um, was what you just approved in item number eight. Um, the entire fund is $325,600. And as Chuck detailed um, in his presentation, there is a cap of $35,000 for the large jurisdiction, jurisdictions and a flat fee of $2,500 for jurisdictions under 51,000, which follows the public safety fee structure. Um, all those in between are a population based spread as far as um, the, the fee. A summary of all of these fees also can be found in the appendix um, by jurisdiction. And now I will turn it over to Chuck. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're happy to answer questions about the details and there might be other commentary from members of the budget and finance committee. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it to COG secretary, treasurer, supervisor Lusk. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I would happily take any questions. Uh, thank you. Let me let me do questions in the right order this time. So first, uh, let us get a motion on the table. Is there okay. a motion and a second yes. to adopt resolution 45-2021? Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Wonderful. Second. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions from board members from Virginia? Um, yes, uh, Dave Snyder. Um, question in the transportation area. Is there sufficient funding there to carry out the climate change related work that the TPB board has uh, approved? That is an interim long range plan that meets our climate change um, objectives, number one, and whether there's adequate funding there to maintain the highway safety programs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Appreciate it. Mr. Srikant could uh, respond to that question. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. The budget that's being proposed is for the next fiscal year, starting July 1, uh, which would be TPB's uh, Unified Planning Work Program for the upcoming fiscal year, which will include uh, the beginning of the interim plan update. Uh, that update work will extend over two fiscal years. So we do plan to have funding set aside to begin and continue that work. Uh, number two, uh, the funding for completing the climate change mitigation study that the TPB has currently initiated is all contained within the existing fiscal year. So that funding is available. Any climate related work activity that would pertain to the interim update will be funded through the um, Funding for the plan update. So there is adequate funding. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions from members from Virginia? Uh, members from Maryland? And last but certainly not least, uh, any questions from members from the District of Columbia? All right. Uh, well, are there any? Let's move to a vote. Are there any uh, abstentions or nay votes? Hearing none, the motion passes. Moving to agenda item 10, optimizing high capacity transit stations and elevating in, in equity emphasis areas. As uh, everyone is aware, the COG board and task force have been working hard since the leadership retreat in July to focus our regional planning priorities around high capacity transit station areas and equity emphasis areas. We spent a lot of time discussing the importance of elevating these areas throughout the region. Last month, we heard from the HCT and EEA task force chair, Phyllis Randall, along with Mr. Bean and Mr. Conti Shrikant, summarizing the two resolutions we have in front of us today. 
While staff are here to answer any questions, I'd really uh, like to use our time today to hear from board members. So let me turn it over to Chuck to get us started. Thank you. Um, I'll do a little bit of air traffic control where we've come from on this and where the uh, documents are. Uh, to say the board has spent a fair amount of time drilling down on these two resolutions is an understatement. Uh, these have been board, board items since May, the focus of the retreat, and a first read last month uh, with uh, analysis undergirding this over the last two years. So not just months in the making, but years in the making. Focusing mixed youth growth, uh, mixed use growth along transit corridors has been a hallmark of our work over the past 25 years. Now focusing on land optimization on transit nodes, meaning mixed use and mixed income, and weaving in equity to all of our analyses is setting the framework for regional planning for the next decade. Not in the abstract, but in the concrete. Uh, before, before you today are identified 225 high capacity transit station areas by 2030. Significant in part because these nodes are just 10% of the region's land mass, but we expect will come for 55% of the job growth. Also 350 census tracts known as equity emphasis areas. Significant because these census tracts are just 10% of the region's land mass, but contain 30% of the region's population. If you want to want to address equity, you need to focus on these areas. Just a little bit more air traffic control on this item before I turn to Vice Chair Dorsey. The documents pertaining to these two resolutions begin on page 69 of the board packet. For HCTs, uh, there's a map on 70, a list on starting on page 76, and the resolution on page 84. For equity emphasis areas, there's a map on page 88, a breakdown by jurisdiction in 91, and the resolution on page 94. Note that we have kept the same documents that you've been reviewing since July. That said, staff have received some feedback related to specifics on a few of these locations, census tracts adjacent to jurisdictional boundaries, for example, and we will continue to work with members on these specifics. Further, as local plans develop and change over time, we expect these locations to also be updated. 225 is the baseline high capacity transit station areas by 2030. More can be added as funding is secured. On the equity emphasis area census tracts, we will examine future data from the American Community Survey every year and iterate on the equity emphasis area census tracts. But today's action is about agreement on the overarching planning principles of both. But the executive committee suggests for this final round that we engage in discussion about both of these together. Then after comments from board members, I understand Vice Chair Dorsey is prepared to subsequently move each of these resolutions on behalf of the task force who reported to you last month via Chair Randall. So first comments from Vice Chair Dorsey and others, and then I would expect Chair White to return to Vice Chair Dorsey to move each of these resolutions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bean and Chairman White. And just to reorient everyone to the resolutions that are included, which we did have a first reading of last month. So we will not go back and go through it again since they are uh, substantially the same. But just to remind you all, there is one uh, resolution R46 concerning the high capacity transit areas, which really solidifies the uh, planning priority behind all of the work that COG and TPB uh, do when it comes to optimizing land use. And again, HCTs are viewed as a tool and a possibility to uh, better our results when it comes to having a sufficient enough supply of housing to meet expected demand to also be able to leverage that increase in housing supply to create better of housing affordability in concord with COG's goals, to reduce trans, uh, congestion on our transportation corridors, vehicular congestion, while also uh, maximizing the investments that we've already made in uh, transit that is not necessarily reaching the capacity that it was designed for, and also to promote active transportation so that we can improve individual health and overall better our region's outcomes when it comes to addressing climate change. That particular resolution has uh, a few key operable areas. Um, one is to have priority consideration of HCTs at all levels of planning, uh, not just at our regional level, but that it be imbued within your local efforts as well. That COG make sure it prioritizes its efforts 
on supporting uh, local jurisdictions in areas as needed. And that local governments really commit to addressing the low hanging fruit that's out there, uh, recognizing that we can use micro transit and by completing bike and ped networks, we can maximize active transportation to all of these HCTs. And it can be a complementary way to achieve many of the goals that we talk about regionally, such as vision zero and as mentioned before, climate change. And that we also prioritize completion of the National Capital Trails Network, something that is half built already and mostly planned. So really committing us to uh, using this framework that we've all been sort of revolving around, but to bring it some specific focus and concrete actions in the year ahead. Then there is a uh, resolution R47, which concerns the equity emphasis areas. Again, uh, not changed from last month, <clears throat> but here we have this really great tool that has been uh, developed with a, a sound methodology uh, in, in accord with the best data that we have available to really look at areas that are uh, predominated by individuals who are significantly lower income, comprise minority groups, in, in, in more than one or uh, have one minority group and uh, also a level of low income concentration. And so uh, for, for this really the uh, fundamental takeaway is that equity emphasis areas are going to be uh, prioritized in our region in a way that we ensure that uh, those areas, those 350 areas that, that include one and a half million uh, persons uh, they are no longer left out of the benefits and are no longer missing from the efforts that we have to bring vitality and prosperity to our region. So with that, welcome any questions that anybody may have on the resolution, any comments. Um, while I do have the floor, I will address, I know that we received uh, some late breaking communication from the Coalition for Smarter Growth uh, looking to uh, maybe redefine uh, the HCTs um, that we have to include um, areas that have high frequency transit. Um, I would just encourage people as they look at that communication to realize that, you know, one, that is a request to sort of redefine how HCTs were, were iterated, um, which is something that we may very well may want to do with future iterations. Uh, but the point of these resolutions is not to codify 225 HCTs and 351 EEAs. It is to adopt these as framework fundamental principles that guide our efforts. So uh, I think we all welcome the opportunity through better methodologies or, or the refinement of local plans to change what constitutes HCTs or EEAs if it if it makes sense for the region. Thank you. Uh, did did Chair McKay have uh, anything to add? Um, thank you very much. I just very briefly, um, I wholeheartedly support this. I know I uh, spoke to this at the retreat and, and you know, frankly, um, I think this is way overdue. Um, I'm glad we're doing it as a region. Um, and, you know, hopefully this is a tool for those of us in our jurisdictions that sometimes have difficulty securing funding, uh, especially for our equity emphasis areas. And we know that, you know, our future growth is going to be centered around transit. And so the marriage of these two things, in my mind, uh, will help steer the way not only for better regional solutions, uh, but frankly, better solutions uh, for our community. Uh, the Richmond Highway Corridor in Fairfax County is, is kind of a poster child. Uh, for both of these resolutions and that we are going to be investing 1 billion dollars in the highway. It has regional connectivity opportunities. Um, it's a major thoroughfare. Uh, it's certainly an equity emphasis area and frankly, um, an area uh, that has been overlooked for too long. And so by doing something like this at COG, uh, we not only send a message as a region about, you know, where our priorities lie. Um, but also, um, you know, marrying equity, emphasis, transit, all the things that Christian just said uh, that contribute to quality of life and, you know, access uh, is a key element of equity. And without transit, uh, too many of our people don't have access to good jobs and success. And without looking at the climate issues associated with, with increased ridership and transit, 
Uh, we also aren't making the environmental investments in these communities that, that are necessary and warranted. And so I'm a strong uh, believer in both of these resolutions. I'm glad uh, we're at this point uh, with COG. Um, and frankly, I look forward to other major corridors in the region, uh, similar to the Route 1 corridor, being able to embark, as literally the name of our uh, program, embark uh, on this journey to build up communities that really for too long um, and, and unacceptably uh, have been left behind uh, by this region. And so um, put me down as a strong supporter of this and uh, endorse everything that Christian just shared. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll get to questions in just one second. Wanted to recognize uh, Vice Chair uh, Mayor Kate Stewart. Thank you. And I just want to add my thanks to everyone for their hard work on this. Um, and also just to note that our resolution specifies local governments, um, but we all know that states have an important role to achieve these goals on high um, capacity transit areas and equity emphasis areas. And I'd request that this should be part, become part of COG's legislative agenda when it is taken up in the next two to three months. And in the interim, I request that we send, um, after we pass it today, of course, a, a cover letter, um, either from the executive committee or from um, the executive director to our state delegations with the resolutions um, that conveys this is where we see the region going and how states can help. Um, so I just wanted to um, thank everyone for their hard work on this and um, you know, help us move it forward and make sure it's integrated in our work in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I saw a number of hands, so let me go by jurisdiction, starting with the District of Columbia. Are there any questions from members from DC? Okay, hearing none. Um, any questions from members from Maryland? Uh, Mr. Davis, and then Ms. Uh, Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chair um, and colleagues. Um, th this has been uh, a lift for us, uh, a work of our hearts uh, for several years, and, and I certainly appreciate and, and would quickly say um, church let the hat be passed to all of the comments made by both Mr. Um, Stewart and Mr. McKay. And, and over the several years as we've talked, I just would like to, to remind us that we started down the path of economic development and we worked together uh, to bring jobs to the Washington metropolitan region, HQ2 landed uh, here in the greatest place that it could. Uh, we worked together with regard to um, our transit system, as, as you all, we talked about earlier, it was broken. We needed to work and band together to fix it. Um, Ms. Perry brought to our, to our table the constant scourge of, uh, of our neglect to recognize housing as a, a situation that we needed to deal with. And we talked about housing affordability. Uh, and we and we worked hard as a council of governments to essentially uh, begin the conversation about repairing our housing affordability, creating opportunities for middle and low income families. And we focused in on this piece called high capacity transit. And we talked about making the place, utilizing our land, our transportation and our housing to essentially get to the crux of the matter and its equity. People, that's all we've been talking about the entire time. The crux of the matter is equity. We collectively are creating through these resolutions, resolutions the framework for equity in the greatest metropolitan region in the country. This is a profound effort by a bunch of profound people working for more people than just themselves. It's heartwarming, and I am so proud to be a part of it. Chuck, Chuck, we talked about this thing, and I, I kept saying it's convergence, the convergence of land use, the convergence of transportation, the convergence of, of our policies. And in Prince George's County, we embarked on a similar situation when we, when we first started down. We didn't have a comprehensive housing strategy. Our plan, our general plan for the county was years old. We had to recreate it. That told us that we had to rewrite how we operated our land use capacity and focus on our transit centers. So we, we embarked on rewriting our zoning ordinance. But again, folks, the crux of the matter is equity. All of us for all of us. 
And, and I'm just so proud that my colleagues, especially Mr. White and Mr. Dorsey, who I've worked with for the last, it seems now like we've been brothers and almost like we came, came up together in, in high school and played on the playground to get to this point. But I am so proud that God put us together in this moment to make these things happen. People will forget the words, but we will memorialize it today with these resolutions. And I'm, I'm certain that all of my co colleagues will continue to move. And let me stop before I start preaching. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, uh, Ms. Newton, you wanna, wanna follow that? You were just taking the words right out of my um, thoughts, Chair. I was gonna say, it's very hard to follow Preacher Davis, and it is. And I won't repeat everything that's been said. I just wanna add mine and the city of Rockville's strong support to the resolution and thank all of you for all the work as we move the region forward. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, was there anyone else from uh, Maryland who had a question or comment? All right, any members from Virginia? All right, uh, Ms. Bailey and then uh, Mr. Lusk and then uh, Mr. Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all we can say right now is hallelujah. <laughs> because I tell you, um, I this is, um, this, I agree with um, Councilman Davis. This this makes us proud to be a part of such a wonderful organization um, um, like COG because we are on the cutting edge. We understand the necessities uh, of people. And, and this is going back to what Chairman McKay said about, you know, entirely in the region, particularly, you know, not particularly, but inclusive of the Route 1 corridor so important you know and so we are I, I want i feel so empowered in this moment because we are doing great work we're doing the people's work and um and so i will wholeheartedly and robustly endorse this resolution because it is absolutely timing is everything and this is the time that we need to get this done and so thank you so much for the visionaries um, that have put this together to usher in a new a new day as it relates to equity. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll say I also wholeheartedly support uh, both of these resolutions and very specifically on the equity uh, emphasis areas. Thinking about the portion of Fairfax County that I represent, which um, Chairman McKay alluded to, Richmond Highway, there are so many needs and there's so much opportunity that could come to that area and they have been unfortunately left out. And this is a way for us to account for that and to make sure that we're giving them uh, the same access to employment, to training. And you know, ultimately this is the opportunity to help them, you know, improve their quality of life. And the actions and decisions that we're gonna make here are gonna have a positive, positive impact on the lives in minutes. So I'm excited to support both these resolutions and also want to thank COD, the leadership here as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Snyder. Thank you very much. First, a question, and then I'll make a couple uh, comments briefly. Um, I want to go back to the uh, Coalition for Smarter Growth question. Um, is the specific lists, are, are they sort of evergreen in the sense that they can be updated? I'm thinking particularly of Route 7 BRT in Northern Virginia would certainly um, meet an equity emphasis and an environmental uh, thing, um, environmental objective. So um, tell me a little bit more about how we're going to continue to use this document after we establish its framework and specific locations today. I think I'll begin and Conti can add, yes, uh, evergreen and iterative. Um, I would say that there'd be a high value on the project that you mentioned, uh, Columbia Pike through Route 7. And when it advances from the planning stage into the long-range transportation plan, um, our general definition is a reasonable expectation of funding that uh, it would meet the definition and that it would be put in there. So short answer, yes, evergreen and yes, iterative. Okay, thank you. So just a, co a couple comments. I think what we're doing here is truly unique. Um, we had one set of issues, another set of issues, and here we're linking them together and solving both. And I think that's not only good 
practice and theory, but is also ultimately good for the taxpayers that support us all. If that $1 can be used for multiple purposes, then that, that $1 is being used in the most effective way possible. I wanna make one other comment. I, I believe that our region is only as strong as our most vulnerable portions and people in our region. It's often been said that a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, the rising tide didn't lift all boats. So I think what we're trying to do here is strengthen the region overall by bringing up those who have been um, underserved and vulnerable for ways and for reasons beyond their control. So I view this as strengthening our region because again, I think a region is only as strong as its most vulnerable parts, and we're addressing those parts with these actions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Briskman. Thank you so much. Um, we are absolutely very excited about this, and I'm sure Chair Randall is disappointed she can't be here today, um, but she she did some work on this, and I know she's very proud of it. Um, one comment, the uh, high capacity transit stations for Loudoun are still listed under Frederick in the document. <laughs> I brought it up at our retreat and I'm like, we have three stations coming. I want them in there. <laughs> so can, I'm hoping that we can get that fixed um, to put our stations in Loudoun in the documentation. <laughs> um, also, uh, I just wanted to say the equity emphasis areas are both of these are actually very important, like for our zoning rewrite that we're going through right now, the, to, to be able to use the high capacity transit um, stations and and the, uh, you know, the, the, the data that COG has brought to this and the philosophy that COG is bringing to this, we will definitely be using it in the zoning ordinance rewrite. And also the equity emphasis areas um, as we move through our planning and some of our projects, such as our linear parks and trails and our missing sidewalk links and those sorts of things. Now, every time I'm asking, you know, our staff, are you looking at the equity emphasis areas from COG? Are you looking at those when we're doing these this planning? So, so it's again, I, I think it was uh, Ms. Bailey that said she's very proud to be part of this organization and very happy to have all of this data and information at our fingertips as we do our work. So, of course, Loudoun County is very supportive and I thank staff uh, and COG very much for this. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from members from Virginia? Well, before I turn it back over to uh, Mr. Dorsey uh, to uh, move the resolutions, let me just uh, add my uh, my my thanks and congratulations to the entire board. Uh, as Mr. Davis said, this has been years in the, in the works and and has really uh, taken a lot of thought, a lot of effort, a lot of energy and pushing from the COG board members, from COG staff uh, and, and leadership from the organization as a whole. So this is, uh, you know, momentous in, in terms of the, the work that we do and really uh, is a, 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 a key uh, signal of the importance of COG and working as a, a convener of the region and really helping us uh, to set ourselves on uh, the right path, but also to set us on the path together. So uh, with that, let me turn it back over to uh, Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it is with, uh, with deep pleasure and satisfaction and on behalf of uh, Chair Phyllis Randall and the members of the uh, HCT and Equity Emphasis Areas Task Force and with a big thank you to our staff that I moved the adoption of resolutions R46 and R47-2021. Second. Wonderful. Are there any abstentions or nay votes? Hearing none, uh, the resolutions pass. Very, very good job, everybody. All right. Now, now, now you can go, uh, Mr. Davis. That's what you've been waiting for. Look at God. <laughs> and I do really want to want to shout out uh, uh, Mr. Davis, who was chair last year when a lot of this work got done. Um, so I, I really want to give him a, a lot of credit for that. Uh, we will uh, move forward to agenda item. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I think I skipped ahead of my agenda. I did. Agenda item 11, uh, housing affordability planning grants 
program. Uh, the board will, uh, for this item, be briefed on a new COG initiative, an exciting new initi initiative, uh, the Housing Affordability Planning Grants Program, which is designed to assist local jurisdictions with the planning, approval, and development of housing around transit stations. This new grant program will award flexible grants of up to $75,000 for projects that have potential to create greater housing opportunities near transit and are accessible to people with lower incomes. This program will help advance the board's vision for the region by increasing housing near high capacity transit and increasing the amount of housing units available to low and middle income households. Today, we're joined uh, by Mr. Bean and Amazon Housing Equity Fund Director and friend of the region, Catherine Buell, to brief us on this program. After that, the board will be asked to adopt resolution R48-2021, endorsing the creation of a housing affordability planning grant program to support these efforts. Uh, so let me turn it over to Mr. Bean. Thank you. Board, appreciate your passage of the HCT and EEA resolutions. These two planning constructs, constructs join with COG's climate goals for 2030 and the regional housing targets to form what I'm internally calling COG's Fab Four for the next decade. Each is important in their own discipline and each reinforces the other in a unified planning framework. We're committed to keeping you regularly updated on our progress, advancing this framework, and I'm excited that we can already put these planning principles into action with this item. As noted earlier, COG has several grants programs, principally focused on mini grants for technical assistance planning, such as the new Transit Within Reach program. Last month, the uh, first three projects were selected uh, by TPB. One was for improving MARC access in Montgomery County. Another for metro, metro rail access in Prince George's and another for VRE access in Manassas. Another mini grants program is TLC. I mentioned that uh, my first remarks about Alexandria transportation and land use connections. Uh, early funding to advance something interesting. The example today was the funding of fare study uh, last spring that contributed to the decision to eliminate fares on dash by the city of Alexandria. So this new program is like the TLC for housing affordability. Uh, when I first broached this idea with COG Vice Chair Mayor Stewart, she said this is like operation, operationalizing our housing targets. Those targets are the right amount in the right place, and this context means transit, and at the right price point, we define that as affordable to lower and middle income residents. The hope is that while there may be a limited number of grants to start, that these projects will spur imagination and will do for housing affordability what the TLC grant did for DASH. You will see my transmittal memo to the board on the subject on page 97 of the board packet, a uh, description of the proposed program on page 98 and a resolution on page 99. You see, while this has been conceived of by COG staff, its launch is made possible through a contribution from Amazon. And that's why I'm so pleased to turn to Catherine Buell, director of Amazon's relatively new $2 billion housing equity fund to describe Amazon's interest in this program specifically and COGS housing targets generally, and to put this in context of plans to support housing affordability initiatives in the region. After Ms. Buell, she and I will be able to respond to questions at the appropriate time the board may be interested in moving R48. So, Catherine. Great, thank you, Chuck. Um, thank you, Chairman Wade. Thank you to each of you um, and the entire COG team for all of your work to improve equitable transit options throughout the capital region. As Chuck mentioned, my name is Catherine Buell and I have the pleasure of overseeing Amazon's more than $2 billion commitment to creating or preserving 20,000 affordable housing units in three of our hometown communities, including HQ2 um, here in the capital region. Let me start by saying how much I and Amazon admire the work that COG has been doing in the capital region to advance regional equity through transit investments and housing affordability. Amazon shares your vision and goals. At Amazon, we believe the 
private and public sectors can collaborate to help address housing affordability challenges. We are committed to leveraging our reach to support innovative affordability housing affordability initiatives. This includes, as many of you know, our $300 million commitment to creating or preserving 3,000 new affordable homes near public transit in our hometown communities, 125 of which went to Metro to help create more than 1,000 new homes in the Washington, D.C. area. Today, we are proud to announce that as a continuation of Amazon's Housing Equity Fund transit investments, we are committing another $500,000 to COD to support how the housing affordability planning program. The funding will be used by COG to provide up to $75,000 in subgrants for design work, feasibility studies, zoning analyses to help jumpstart the um, hopefully numerous developments around the capital region that will be taking place. The housing affordability planning program um, will join a portfolio of programs that COG is supporting to really create these transit oriented communities. We share COG's belief that providing equitable transit oriented communities is an integral part of meeting the region's growing housing needs. Adding housing near transit stations that is affordable to low and middle income households addresses inequalities in access to transportation, education, and economic opportunities. It also reduces transportation costs. The region's reliance on cars for all of the transportation needs contributes to the region's climate goals and supports economic development and other non residential land uses located near transit. In particular, we share COG's vision of aligning high capacity transit station areas and equity emphasis areas with the location of affordable housing opportunities as being a key driver to supporting the region's population and economic growth in an equitable manner. We're excited to support local governments and affordable housing efforts as we work to capitalize on this special moment in time and catalyze commitments to achieving the region's adopted housing targets. I want to sincerely thank you for all that you do, and I hope that all, a lot of the work that you've been doing for years is reflected in how Amazon is rolling out our affordable housing strategy here in the capital region. Um, we are huge fans of each of you and all of the work that you're doing and so proud to support COG in their effort to create transit-oriented communities. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you. She and I are both uh, prepared to uh, respond to questions about the proposed program. Uh, the essence of our 45 is to receive this funding and start this housing affordability planning grants program. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Bean and Ms. Ms. Buell. Uh, very, very exciting news of being uh, innovative and unique uh, housing tools, things to help us get projects going or just reimagine housing, take a little chance uh, are very, very exciting. Uh, one thing, I, and I apologize if you covered and I missed it, what will the application process look like? The application process, applications will go to COG. It'll be similar to the other uh, technical assistance planning grants we have, like uh, transportation land use connections and transit within reach. Uh, we're going to do our best to uh, minimize lots of paperwork. Um, we want to make sure that this is aligned with uh, local housing plans. So that while local governments uh, would be uh, eligible, housing authorities would be eligible. We would also envision that nonprofit housing developers would be eligible, but uh, important to coordinate through the local housing housing departments. I think if staff could uh, put up a link to uh, transportation land use connection transit within reach, then we can uh, see uh, more concretely what the application uh, would look like. Thank you very much uh, for questions. Let me this time start with Maryland. Are, are, do any of my colleagues from Maryland have any questions? Wonderful. Uh, any questions from members from DC? I just want to say hello, Catherine, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions from uh, colleagues from Virginia? Yes, hello, Catherine. Welcome aboard. As, as Ms. Perry said, it's, it's great to see progress. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dorsey. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Catherine. Welcome. Thank you so very much. Um, you know, I just uh, am heartened to see Amazon's continued engagement and commitment in helping our region meet uh, some of our most uh, challenging problems and for uh, your following through on behalf of the company with your commitment as you uh, grew your presence here to be a partner in helping us meet those challenges. And, and this particular program is just so important. As we all know, um, when it comes to developing innovative, affordable housing uh, initiatives and programs, particularly ones that are uh, higher cost due to their proximity to transit, one of the key barriers is a lack of uh, access to capital to deal with a lot of the soft costs that go with coming uh, with developing such proposals. So this providing a source that's not, you know, going to need to be paid back, that's not subject to, you know, an overall pro forma is really a key to unlocking what I think will be a lot of great, great innovative projects that will help meet these goals. So I think uh, this is just really a great example of how um, we can get multiple sectors convening, each providing value that they can provide. And I, I know that this will be the key to great things happening. So thank you. Agreed. Thank you so much. I, I, if it, I can, Chuck, I will just share that I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I was a, a child of a commuter kid. So I fully value all of the transit investments in the region. It makes it so possible for all of us to be connected. And even more excited about all of the regional expansion efforts that are going on um, and the growth of our region and agree that this work is really going to be instrumental um, years from now. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you, Vice Chair Dorsey. Are there any other questions? Wonderful. Uh, is there a motion uh, and a second to adopt resolution R48-2021? Motion. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Are there any abstentions or nay votes? Hearing none, the motion passes. Uh, we will now move, and thank you very much, uh, Ms. Buell. Always good to see you, and thank you for, for this program. We're, we're excited about it. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, we will move to agenda item 12, the regional crime report, which is our last item for the day. Uh, COG Police Chiefs Committee Chair Chief Russell Hamill will brief us on the results of the 2020 annual crime report on crime and crime control. Uh, so let me welcome Chief Hamill. There you are. Welcome. Very much. Um, good afternoon to everybody. And I can see on my screen that you are uh, you're getting the PowerPoint now. But uh, to begin with, thank you all for your time and uh, for this opportunity. Uh, your police chiefs. Um, want me to thank you for your continued support for our collective efforts at protecting and serving our communities throughout the region, as well as our efforts to uh, better connect with our communities in meaningful ways and to continue to truly uh, embrace our uh, mantra of service before self that we uh, preach to our departments um, throughout the region. As you can see, uh, the overall crime report um, as prepared by COG staff with uh, input from the police chiefs committee um, focuses on offenses uh, compiled throughout our jurisdictions uh, in the COG region, the NCR, and they use various methods of uh, reporting, which I won't uh, bore you with um, at this stage. So if we can go to the next uh, screen, um, you'll see that uh, we had an overall uh, increase of 8.4% during 2020 for criminal offenses. Uh, a number of uh, over 8,000 more offenses than in 2019. Violent crime increased at a rate of 28.6% um, in 2020, and property crime increased at 5.5%. Uh, we increased, we saw uh, increase, um, these increases were consistent with a national increase in these crimes um, throughout our region. So to the next screen, you can see that our per capita had a one point three percentage point increase uh, as our region's population increased to just under six million residents. Uh, this is the second consecutive year for an increase in this crime rate per capita and uh, at 17.6 per thousand. It remains in decline when we compare it to our 2016 numbers. So. Oh, um, we've experienced an increase in these offenses in 2020. 
uh, we want to highlight or, or reiterate there's no clear evidence yet to indicate that the five-year trend of property crime and violent crimes declining is being fully reversed. However, we are deeply concerned with this recent trend line. Uh, the region's increase in these Part 1, Part A offenses is consistent with the FBI's quarterly UCR preliminary data demonstrating a na national trend of an increase in 3.3% in violent crime nationally. Uh, nationally, you're seeing a 25% increase in homicides and a 10.5% increase in aggravated assaults for 2020 as compared to 2019. Additionally, the region's increase in violent crime in 2020 is consistent with the national level data presented in the pandemic social unrest and crime in U.S. cities 2020 year end update from the National Commission on COVID-19 and criminal justice. That report found that homicide rates across 34 American cities increased by over 30 percent and aggravated assaults by 6 percent and motor vehicle theft by 13 percent. And part one, part A offenses can be attributed to the challenges law enforcement and indeed all of government has faced in par as part of this uh, global uh, pandemic. Um, as the pandemic continued to progress, many agencies, uh, uh, not just in this region, across the country, indeed across the world, found it difficult to maintain staffing levels and recruit officers. Some staff were even forced to work from home due to health and safety concerns, as well as building occupancy concerns um, and this was not customary uh, uh, prior to the pandemic as everybody had to make adjustments um, and we saw uh, a training decrease uh, due to cancellations as i mentioned and, and tied into those safety concerns furthermore the current climate involving law enforcement including calls for defunding and certain legislative initiatives and other items of concern to law enforcement professionals have made retention and recruit, recruitment efforts even more challenging than in the recent past. Although the pandemic presented many challenges to law enforcement agencies in the NCR, a commitment to regionalism still existed, as we witnessed uh, earlier this year. Early in the pandemic, the COG Police Chiefs Committee developed a summary document um, of the region's enforcement of stay-at-home executive orders and the necessary credentialing associated with those orders. This was shared with all local enforcement agencies and aided situational awareness across the region. 2021, the COG Police Chiefs Committee and subcommittees are working in the following focus areas. One, intelligence information sharing and situational assessments. Two, operational coordination. And finally, mutual aid response processes that we've been working on. From strategic to tactical levels, regions, police committees, regularly meet to discuss innovative techniques and best practices in the implementation of these focus areas in the NCR with diverse resourcing to include uh, UASI grants, uh, regional public safety funding. The police chiefs committee will continue to sponsor new initiatives that close the gap in crime and terrorism activity in the region. Um, you know, as, as noted in the PowerPoint, as I mentioned, COVID-19 and social stressors, economic stressors, um, uh, we believe help lead to some of the issues we're seeing uh, of recent in crime. So these issues, as I mentioned, defunding, deep policing, making enforcement efforts, uh, retention of personnel and recruitment of new officers even more challenging. Many people don't realize that the, the, the damage the pandemic has done. Uh, 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 people in its face and, and, and peeling it back some, the, the deep issues and the deep concerns but also with the damage that did to our community outreach efforts across the country and leading to communication and relationship breakdowns in the communities we serve. And the, the, uh, the, the I will say, efforts that have been done to help preserve those relationships. Many people don't see the understand yet that the number one killer of law enforcement across the country since the beginning of the pandemic has been COVID-19, not vehicle collisions, not shootings anymore. The number one killer of police officers, peace officers, has been COVID-19. So in bringing solutions to the table when we bring these concerns, um, we will continue to increase our professionalism. We're not going to, in order, in the efforts to hire and retain, we're not going to walk away from our professional standards. We're going to maintain these high standards for hiring, high standards and accountability, and we'll continue to train for success. Training efforts are reopening as well. We utilize resources at our disposal to provide for qualified uh, candidates to enter our profession and retain our highly skilled and dedicated staffs so as to best serve our communities. 
and we will continue to build upon our professional relationships within this region in order to jointly protect and serve our communities. That last step is immeasurably helpful for uh, police chiefs throughout the region. Your police chiefs rely on one another to help uh, through uh, moments of crisis, as well as moments of, of um, just managing our efforts to, to work jointly together. As we all know, uh, people who would prey on our communities don't pay attention to jurisdictional lines. They cross indiscriminately, and we need to maintain our focus and our contact with each other in order to best serve our communities. Um, uh, we'll, as, I, as you can see, um, focusing uh, trust and transparency in the community maintains as well one of our solutions in our in our efforts in going forward as well. And with that, I will, I will close this portion and, and um, open it uh, up to any questions or concerns you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Chief uh, Hamill. Um, let me let me start with uh, uh, colleagues from Virginia. Do any colleagues from Virginia have questions for Chief Hamill? Uh, yes, Mr. Snyder. So, um, this is a truly alarming report. Um, despite the somewhat diplomatic language, uh, we're going in the exact wrong direction in terms of crime. I hope that, and I will ask the COG board to take this issue on um, more directly than just to hear a report. And then in future COG meetings, I'd like to see both regionally and locally what we can best do to reverse this trend. So I'll ask the, the, the chief here who presented what what should we do? Um, this is, you know, COVID was a terrible thing for everybody, and we're still living with it. And I I get that, but these numbers are just not acceptable. I mean, in my view, the basic reason why we have governments is to provide public safety and to protect everyone. And clearly, something is going wrong here. So so, Chief, tell me tell me what we ought to be doing. Give us a list and I hope the COG board will take this up as well as the police chiefs in the very near future. Thanks. Chief, you're, you're muted. Muted me because my phone's not muted. <laughs> Can't hear you yet. We heard you for a second. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, there we go. So my phone's showing I'm not muted. So uh, I apologize there. The, uh, um, so, uh, the crime issues facing our communities is a grave concern to us. Um, I believe that, uh, and I've already noted our, our areas of, of uh, um it's you know we see aggravated assaults which uh, of course domestic violence cases are part of and the fact people were home weren't leaving their homes and and, and that that led to uh, an increase in those areas as well and that ties into the, the most violent of all crimes the murder rates as well um i'm hopeful as we come out of this and get back to normalcy that we'll see a natural decline back towards the trend we were we had since 2017 of crime going down um across the region um but we country we've seen as we all know it's, it might be the elephant in the room right here we've seen to a degree of vilification of policing and for us um that has made matters difficult in in regarnering community trust in regarnering um our, our abilities to to best communicate with the city with the pandemic with the i'm sorry with the community with the pandemic our community connections naturally diminished. However, our, uh, you saw across the region, officers working at food banks, officers doing uh, uh, the best. Haven't before via venues like this through Zoom and, and WebEx and other, other areas. And I, I think us being able to get back and actually connect it with uh, uh, the community Professionalism of of us trust and transparency and, and reading the 21st century policing report and implementing President Obama's 21st century policing report. 
um, it, it led to us being able to better connect and drive crime down. And I think as we come out of the pandemic, we'll see those efforts redoubled and being fruitful for us. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let's see, uh, Ms. Gross and then Mr. Lusk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I wanted to add on to what um, Mr. Snyder said, but I, I think, Chief, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I was going to suggest that it's really, you know, we need to reduce the crime rate, but we also need to in, enhance and recruit officers to serve our community. You were, but you, you beat me to the punch. I do think that we need to, if, if COG is going to take this on, and I and I think it was a, a very good thing to do, I think we also need to look at the, the, the whole workforce piece that we've been doing in COG for a long time, wanting to make sure that we have good jobs and we have the talent to fill them. And certainly with the decline in the number of officers, the, uh, the general atmosphere that is in some cases keeping people from applying to our police departments. We, we really need to take this on wholeheartedly um, as a comprehensive effort, both with the number of police officers that we need and also the, the crime reductions. One of our challenges, I think, is that as we were growing, I know it's happened in Fairfax County, as we've been growing over the last many years, decades actually, our officers are now at retirement age. How do we backfill? How do we make that an honorable and and uh, um, attractive uh, career path? The officers I know are fabulous, but I also know they are really under stress. And so we need to, uh, as we look at the lack of uh, of jobs for all our, or people to fill the jobs, it's not just police, it's nurses and a, and a number of others, as we know. But I think that we need to focus on the um, the career path for our officers because uh, that is, as Dave Snyder said, it's basic to what government does. That's you know keeping pub the public safe. So I would hope that perhaps the we have a lot of new police chiefs in the air in the region. Perhaps they can come up with some new suggestions, new ideas that we can uh, use in the region to uh, attract and retain. Um, um, folks to keep us safe. Thank you. I, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay, J thank you very much. Uh, we, we fully agree with that uh, assessment. I, we would, uh, I would offer the idea that, you know, us embracing the idea of health and wellness um, is makes it, uh, and, and that's across the board, not just physical, but mental health and wellness as well. And erase the stigma of you, know, you, you carry a lot of trauma in this job. You can carry the things you see, the things that you in the, that you have to do, and for us to help erase part of that stigma would be helpful. And I think that would help us embrace the younger work staff, work work uh, uh, workers that we want to attract to our profession. I think also looking at the ideas of retention and recruitment and uh, um, and hiring bonuses. Um, you know, it, it's, you're not coming into this profession and the other ones you mentioned teaching and nursing, you're not coming into these professions to get rich, but you should have a living wage that you can support your family and, and take care of uh, your loved ones as well while you're out taking care of the community. I think those are things that COG can look at and embrace as well. Um, I, another thing that, uh, uh, that, that we would to embrace our education not just our education and training wise, but our education, formal education. And when we ask for that, when we ask people to be, uh, uh, have higher education standards of, of bachelor's degrees and, and or, or even uh, masters and, and other professional degrees. Uh, you know, uh, my prior agency, there were six of us that had, had, had law degrees. Um, when you ask for that, we should also pay for that. Um, as we increase those standards, looking to, to increase professionalism, when we do that, we need to look at increasing salary and benefits to be able to do that, to attract the people we want to come in and lead us throughout the 21st century in policing. And I was really trying to keep my, my comments down, not to, not to take up all of your all's time. So uh, I apologize for that. I'll just make the point that uh, Penny stole my thunder. I was gonna be the exact same 
point, which is uh, recruitment and retention of our officers is so vital and so important. Uh, the one area I might pivot to is to say that we've got to figure out how we get more women into our police department and how we get more minorities into our police department. So we've got to think creatively about ways that we can recruit earlier, maybe middle school or earlier, getting them more familiarized with the role of police in the community, giving them the opportunity to interact with police in sort of kind of non-confrontational ways. And I would say that this is something that's going to certainly make a difference as well. But I'd be really interested in hearing um, your and the other police chief's thoughts on like how how do we really figure out how to address this issue? Because this is one, it's not just a regional issue, it's a national issue. But I think collectively we might have to kind of work together because I hate to say it, what we're essentially doing is stealing each other's officers. And there's no benefit in doing that. So we've got to think through strategically how we can all go up together, rise together in finding talented members to come into our individual police departments. But I, I do look forward to talking more about this and appreciate all the work that you're doing and the work you're doing with our chief, Chief Davis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wheeler. Uh, we, we, well, I'm sorry, we, we do need to be mindful of raiding each other's kitchen cabinets as well. Right. That's not being helpful, as you said. And I just want to chime in, you know, we've sort of been on the, because we recognize this about two years ago with regards to who we were recruiting and having trouble recruiting. Prince William County has done a lot in this area. We brought a consulting firm in um, and in, in terms of how we recruit a better reflection of the community, as well as how we do outreach. We recently had a large, our very first large community fair that was put on by our police department, very successful. And they did recruiting there and they've actually set up events at, at at local areas and schools and things like that. So we've been doing a lot. If anybody wants to learn about it, just reach out to me. Just want to throw that in there because right? we know it's, we all know it's an issue and we don't want to just poach other people's. So. Uh, any other questions from uh, colleagues from Virginia? Uh, Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so Chief, I'm, I'm curious as to, um, whether or not you have, along with your colleagues in the region, come up with preferred models for how to uh, deal with an, an element that we haven't really touched much on, and that is how to uh, minimize, first of all, how to improve uh, emotional behavioral health within the community through uh, social interventions, but also as a way to reduce the amount of time that police spend being first responders to uh, calls that are best served by other professionals so that more focus can be spent on uh, crime prevention and arrests for things that are typically within the police department's wheelhouse. I know that these conversations are going on in many jurisdictions, but I'm curious as to whether or not there's been a, a regional look at, at maybe models that could be employed throughout the region to, to better help divert police resources from what are best uh, served as, as behavioral health interventions. And then the, the attractiveness of that, and believe me, as a police chief, and you guys, some of you probably heard me speak, where if we could take some of those calls for service that we had that you're talking about and give them to other agencies, I, I don't know many police chiefs that would argue against that. Um, the, the issue there sometimes becomes we're the only 24 seven source out resource out there. So, um, until others uh, have the abilities to, to, uh, further, uh, expand. Their capabilities to handle these matters outside of 9 to 5 or 7 to 3. Um, we're always going to have uh, police officers being in part social engineers. And I, and I do believe that 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 is part of our responsibilities as well, because. We're, we're going to be the 1st 1 on scenes of, especially of acute mental health crises. Um, now, it would be great if prior to things arriving at that level that measures are in place to help to, to help people out. So they don't, they don't get to that stage. Um, if that's a, a robust uh, mental health services in the community, um, across the region. The, the no magic pill to, to fix this. Um, I know for us, we, we uh, make contacts with our, the county we serve in with their, their uh, 
there are uh, professionals that handle these matters. Um, but again, I, I think um, their services need to become more robust and not to place them at risk. I'm not, I'm not talking about that because I think we hear that argument come out that, you know, oh, well, these people would now, these professionals would be placed at risk. We're not, we're not talking about that. Let's, we can join together to handle those matters. Um, it doesn't have to be either or. It can be jointly where we work together in these. So, and believe me, when those professionals go out and they be, they're placed at risk, the person they're serving is at risk, the community is at risk, officers are at risk. If we go together, we can minimize that risk. We're never going to get rid of all the risk, but we can help minimize that risk and manage it better working jointly together. And I think, and this is Russ Hamill, I think moving in that direction would be better for, for us, uh, not only our profession, but across these professions and the community. Thank you. Uh, anything further from colleagues from Virginia? All right, let me move to colleagues from Maryland and start with uh, Vice Chair Kate Stewart, and then we'll go to uh, Ms. Jackson. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to suggest, um, given the comments from our colleagues on the board today, that the executive committee uh, take this report and that we also go back to the issues that were raised by the chief um, health officers who came to us a few months ago um, and spoke to the board about what they saw was needed regionally. Um, we also know that the staff recently convened a joint meeting of the health officers and the CAOs last week. Um, and to kind of look at and bring all these pieces together and think about how we may approach these issues regionally and bring them back to our colleagues on the board. Um, while I very much appreciate the report from the chiefs today, uh, you know, addressing the crime rates and the issues that we're talking about um, go way beyond our police chiefs um, and uh, bringing in particularly, I think, the recommendations of our health officers and the CAOs, uh, I think will really help us think about this more holistically and how as a board um, we can think about moving forward on this. Robert, you're uh, Chair White. You're muted. You're mute. <laughs> uh, I was I was saying that was a great recommendation and noting the uh, thumbs up from uh, Chuck Bean and from from others. So thank you very much for that recommendation. Uh, are there any other comments or questions from colleagues from Mayor? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, uh, Ms. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and, and thank you, Chief, for your report. Um, having been a, a, a prosecutor in my former life, um, I realized that you can't divorce the uh, the work of the local police department from that of the uh, the uh, agency that is tasked with holding uh, the criminals or the uh, the persons that are arrested responsible. And so, I'm wondering whether or not uh, you've done any analysis as it relates to. Um, rates of prosecution and whether they have changed over the last couple of years as well. I think that would be uh, helpful to understand whether or not uh, there's an issue on the other side that we need to address as well. And thank you. We have not done a, a formal study of such. Uh, anecdotally, I can tell you from hearing from police chiefs uh, in uh, throughout the region where um, they're mentioning that uh, certain crimes are no longer uh, considered prosecutorial worthy. It's a quality of life issues. And I think most police chiefs would tell you nobody's looking for uh, uh, somebody to go to jail for such things. But sometimes these are indicators of other issues in people's lives, uh, substance abuse, mental health issues and the like. And and. Fortunately, the only way people can get help is via the court system. Totally, we're, we could we could mention that. I think a study would be um, uh, uh, last couple of years. What we're seeing crime wise now that tend tends to uh, tie in to maybe prosecutorial efforts as well. Overworked as well. I, I know you guys are probably tired of me playing this song, but. 
Um, they, they're extremely overworked as well in those offices, and we know they have to manage their resources just like we do as best they can. Uh, thank you very much. Are there other uh, questions or comments from uh, members from Maryland? Uh, Ms. Newton. Thanks, Chair White. Uh, I just wanted to say hello to uh, the chief um, being from our fair city. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you for all the work you do. And I would second Ms. Jackson's comment and perhaps, and also um, Mayor Stewart's, and perhaps there is something that COG could do to pull together um, a conversation across uh, disciplines that might help us understand some more of this and maybe we could take a lead. Um, the city of Rockville has seen an exponential increase in car break ins, uh, whether unlocked or locked, and it doesn't matter if it's unlocked or locked. It's still, you know, uh, trespassing on your property. Uh, yesterday we had an armed robbery in uh, on Nelson at a bank. Um, so we are seeing. We are seeing an increase and in whether it's coming from society. I to, to see how. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, if it's coming from societal issues, uh, whatever, we don't know if they're Rockville people or, or not. It doesn't matter. The point is, we got to get a grip. And uh, I think coming together, COG would be a perfect organization to, to really handle a conversation at the regional level. So thank you for the presentation and all the work you do. Thank you, Chair, for letting me speak. Well, thank you very much for the recommendation. Chief, did you want to add to that or respond to it? Say hi to Mayor Newton and thank, as you know, Rockville's dear to my heart. My children are down uh, in that area all the time. So uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for all you and your department did. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from members from uh, Maryland? All right. How about uh, members from DC? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, but for the recruitment effort, I want to brag a little bit about DC. We have an excellent uh, cadet program and we are trying to grow our own police officers and grow them from the community. We have had some success with that. And as you might know, um, our current police chief started in that uh, cadet program right out of high school. So I would just share that with the group. The uh, alarming thing about that report to me was um, the um, the death of officers, the highest number of police uh, uh, deaths were um, from um, COVID. And I also wanted to share that um, the mayor has issued um, a mandatory vaccine policy for all the executive agencies and uh, we are having a really good success with that. I think we have an average uh, vaccine rate now, like 87% of the agencies. And um, I don't know if the departments in the region have any issues with that, with COVID, uh, you know, uh, deaths in the force, but, uh, and we have had some too, but I just wanted to say now we are at, we have the mandatory vax and we think that is helping us uh, stem that. Uh, thank you uh, for that, Ms. Perry. Uh, anything else from the other member from DC? Right. Uh, hearing none, uh, Chief, I, I really want to thank you for, uh, for for being with us today for your presentation, for the work that uh, you and your team and, and other chiefs in, in the region are doing. Um, we, we certainly are, are in this together, and this is, uh, as you noted, noted and as several others uh, have noted, a, a re regional issue. Um, there, there is no board action uh, on this agenda item today, but uh, but again, Chief, really want to thank you uh, and our other chiefs for the work that you all are doing. Appreciate it. And uh, two things: thank you for not making fun of my glasses that were handed down from my father. And you can see I'm much more handsome in person than that picture they used in that report. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. All right, um, we'll move to agenda item 13. Um, 
uh, other business. Uh, one, one piece of other business for today, uh, one of the board's responsibilities is to complete a performance review of its executive director. Uh, so we have a committee to spearhead that, but full uh, board input is important. So I, I would very much encourage everyone to complete that. Uh, to that end, I will send you a survey in the next few days uh, that I would ask you to complete. It is only 11 short questions, and I'm giving you 11 days to do it. So you got one, one question per day. I think we can we can manage that. Uh, what 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 I'll do is uh, I'll compile the results and convene uh, the committee in December, and we'll bring the results to you in January. Uh, beyond the survey, if you have additional feedback, certainly feel free to contact me or other members of the executive committee, Vice Chair Dorsey or Vice Chair Stewart. Uh, you can contact us directly. Is there any uh, other uh, additional business? Yes, Ms. Brisman. Wait, are you muted? I think you're muted. Muted, Julie. I don't know if it's additional business. I just had a comment I wanted to share at some point whenever is appropriate. This would be the best time. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to, to to give a big thank you to COG um, and Jeffrey King and Maya Davis and Steve Waltz um, from the Climate and Energy uh, Department. They came out on September 29th and we had a special business meeting about our energy strategy. Um, and it, they, they gave a great presentation. It was really, really helpful to look at um, our, our analysis and we're working on our new energy strategy and we talked about um, all things from, you know, cost burdens to uh, flooding uh, equity issues with flooding cost burdens, extreme heat islands in the county. And of course, um, the energy use uh, from our data centers, which has just gone through the roof and actually could could be impacting the whole region and our goals for 2030. So I just wanted to give a big thank you for that. It was very informative and eye opening and, and really, really helpful. So th thanks for the time chair. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other additional business? All right. Well, oh, I see some. I see uh, Miss Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just quickly, um, just Julie just made me think of something. I mean, we are just doing impeccable work in Cog, and I'm just, uh, I, I'm, I'm the eternal cheerleader. I'm just so excited about the work that we are doing and moving um, the regional agenda forward. And um, just kudos to my colleagues, my extraordinary leader and colleagues, and to you, Mr. Chair, for uh, just allowing us to be a part of this opportunity. And to Mr. Bain, hats off to you as well. Thank you very much. It is a good team here of uh, regional partners and, and the COG uh, professional staff just out of this world. So thank you very much. You you are our cheerleader, uh, Ms. Bailey. I think she answered all 11 questions. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right, if there is no additional business, uh, then I want to thank everyone for uh, for joining us in the COG Board of Directors virtual meeting today. The next <laughs> COG Board meeting is scheduled for November 10th, 2021. Uh, with that, is there a motion to adjourn in a second? So moved, Supervisor Brisbane. Second. Second. Wonderful. Uh, any abstentions or nay votes? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Bye, everybody.